الأنبياء والمسلمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين uh, I would like uh, to welcome all of you uh, who attended this uh, first webinar throughout uh, this uh, pandemic and also I would like to uh, thank all the speakers uh, for their effort and uh, taking the time to put up together this nice uh, program. Our uh, program tonight uh, will be uh, around the theme of spinal infections. And as you can see, we have four lectures. I would like to thank the Saudi Spine Society for supporting us and uh, making this happen uh, through uh, Kunuz Ritaj. Uh, and also I would like to uh, uh, present our first uh, presenter, Dr. Mohammed Sheikh Omar, who is uh, an infectious disease consultant and an as, uh, assistant professor at King Abdulaziz University. He has done uh, his uh, uh, in internal medicine training as well as his uh, advanced infectious disease fellowship uh, at the University of Miami in the States. So Dr. Sheikh Omar uh, is gonna be talking about uh, uh, protecting ourselves as uh, spine care practitioners during the COVID-19 pandemic. So please, uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, go ahead and you can share your uh, presentation and we can start. Bismillah. <clears throat> and let's mute. You guys can see the presentation now, clear. <clears throat> so first of all, I want to thank the um, organizing committee. I want to thank the Saudi Spine Society um, for inviting me to speak um, in this uh, webinar. Um, I want to thank also Dr. Fahad Abdul-Jabbar for um, coordinating for this uh, webinar to be happening. And Today I'm going to talk about the how to protect yourself as a spine care practitioner during COVID-19 pandemic. Okay. <clears throat> so I have nothing to disclose. And as an introduction, in late December of 2019, a cluster of pneumonia cases was observed in China and specifically in Wuhan city. This cluster of pneumonia, the causative organism at that time was not clear. The WHO was informed and the causative, uh, I, uh, the causative uh, organism was identified as a subtype of coronavirus, which later was named as SARS-CoV-2. So SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus. The disease itself was known as COVID-19 which stand for coronavirus disease and 19 related to the year 2019. Then the disease was spreading globally all over the world. As we can see as of this week, the disease, the disease incidence per million per each country is, is increasing with time. The most affected countries at this moment is countries within Europe, and the United States, which reached up to thousand, more than 1,000 cases per million. The next countries we, uh, which, uh, which is affected is the uh, Iran, Turkey, and Canada, and as we see, Australia, in a little bit of red color. These, these countries actually have around 100 to 1,000 cases per million. In Saudi Arabia, we're around 10 to 100 cases per million population. And as the cases increase, the, the incidence density will increase with time. Now, what do I need to know as a healthcare provider or spinal um, practitioner to protect myself? In order to protect myself, I need to know a lot of information about the disease itself. And the four main categories that we need to know about is the mode of transmission, the clinical feature, so I can identify the patients and any suspected cases. I need to know what should I do in my healthcare facility, whether you're working in a hospital or you work in a clinic. 
And then later on, we're gonna talk about COVID-19 and surgeries, whether we need to schedule the surgery or defer our surgery. Now, when we talk about the mode of transmission, nowadays, the main route of transmission is between humans. Respiratory droplets is the main route, which means when the person cough or sneeze, those droplets will transmit into our mucous membrane if you are in close proximity with the patient. Now, the other route is touches, touching a contaminated surface and then you touch your mucous membrane. Either you touch the eyes, the mouth, or the nose. And there have been debate about airborne um, transmission lately. The most um, evidence-based regarding the airborne is when you do an aerosol generating procedure like intubation, bronchoscopy, or suctioning a secretion. Now, as a guidelines, the WHO is, is sticking with the droplet precaution plus contact precaution, except when doing an aerosol generating procedure. But this is different when it comes to the CDC recommendation. So European and the United States recommendation, they prefer doing an airborne precaution if the facility has the resources to do um, uh, such a, a practice. So you can apply the N95 with face shield and contact precaution. However, they mentioned that an acceptable alternative approach is doing a face mask with the rest of the PPE. Now, the next point is how, what, what is the clinical features of uh, the disease itself? So I can, um, I can suspect the cases in front of me. And when we divide the clinical feature, the mild cases represent most of the presentation. So in around 80% of the time, the patient will have mild disease. So they can walk in the community. They will have cough, fever, but they, don't, they are not very sick to come to the hospital. And that's a good way in some way, but uh, the bad thing about this, but those serve as a vector, so they can transmit the infection in the community. Now, the second portion is we have the moderate to severe cases, around 15% of the, of the cases. And those type of patients, they will come to the hospital sick with pneumonia, require inpatient care. The 5% represent a critical ill patient who require an ICU cases. Now, when we talk about the percentage of the symptoms, the most common presentation is fever in around 80 to 90%. However, some patients, they will not have fever. They may have dry cough, they may have fatigue and decreased appetite. And when you do lab testing, you notice that in the CBC, the most characteristic thing you, you we found is lymphopenia. So when we see the absolute new lymphocyte count and you find it decreased, that's suggestive of the disease. Now there are other atypical presentation which are not common. We notice nowadays some people present with GI manifestation in around, in around five to 7% of the time, diarrhea, nausea, and abdominal pain. So the, we, we have to be aware of uh, atypical presentation, although it's not that common. Now, the case definition so far in Saudi Arabia, um, when you want to suspect a case, you, you, you basically determine on the clinical presentation plus an epidemiological link. And the clinical presentation rely on the most common symptoms, which are fever, cough, and shortness of breath. And then you combine an epidemiological link. Now, interestingly, that epidemiological link Either you travel abroad or you have a contact history, but even nowadays with, we have a cities that we have a community spread within the city. As we see in, down in the, in the table, we, we, we can notice that there are six cities now. There are ongoing community transmission, which are Jeddah, Mecca, Medina, Riyadh, Wal Hafuf, Wal Gatif, and the Gatif. So those cities, if you, if you have a patient, if you encounter a patient with a respiratory illness and those patients are from those city, you have to suspect COVID until proven otherwise. Now coming to the next point, which is COVID and healthcare setting. In the healthcare setting, we have a main, um, we, 
like a main uh, diagram we can put in the healthcare setting. So starting from screening the patient when entering to the facility, whether it's a hospital or it's a clinic, we do visual triaging and we ask also questionnaire for each visitor coming to the facility. Now in places where the community transmission is ongoing, like in Jeddah, we prefer to postpone any elective procedure and non-urgent visit. Now virtual clinic is useful for such a cases. Now how can I protect myself? And when we talk about protecting ourselves, we need to talk about four main types or four main categories that we need to emphasize in a daily basis. We have to remember this so we can do it on a regular basis. Number one, and ensure proper hand hygiene. And I look at hand hygiene when you do before and after anything. So you do hand hygiene before you go into the room and after you exit the room. You do hand hygiene before examining the patient and after examining the patient. Now the next point is social distancing. And when we talk about social distancing, it's not only between you and the patient. Social distancing even between you and your colleagues because the most common frequently encountered, we were noticed from the healthcare pro uh, provider that tested positive, they encounter the, the infection from the colleagues. So the colleague is maybe asymptomatic or have mild infection, and those are the common route of uh, transmitting the virus. Surgical mask in the facility has been a debatable topic, but this month they came to a final recommendation with the CDC and the Ministry of Health uh, that surgical masks should be, should, should be wear during the interviewing any patient or examining patients. You have to ensure learning how to properly doing donning and doffing. And that's basically come from the facility itself. Now we need to know the steps of hand hygiene in order to practice hand hygiene properly. And social distancing, as we mentioned, between you and the patient and between you and any, anyone else. Now, universal masking is interesting. They play a role in reducing the transmission and they also play a role in reducing the anxiety of the wearer. So when you wear the surgical mask, you're gonna feel comfortable in, in examining the, case, the, the patient. But this should, be, should not be happening, um, like you should not be very comfortable when you wear uh, uh, the face mask, because you also need to apply social distancing and hand hygiene together with the face mask, because face mask alone does not protect you from the virus itself. And as we mentioned, the Ministry of Health adopted this recommendation. So nowadays we recommend surgical mask for everyone who is encountering patients. Now the last point is COVID-19 and surgeries. And as we mentioned, when you are in a city or in a place that there is ongoing community transmission, you need to actually defer surgeries, uh, elective surgeries we're talking about. Yeah. So you can defer the elective, uh, the elective surgery and you can even defer the non-urgent clinic visit. And the American College of Surgeons, they put this table and they adopt it from the University of uh, Pennsylvania. So we can mention, we can see here at the, at the bottom of the table, the spine surgery that can be rescheduled, which are the chronic back pain without radiculopathy or any spinal compression. The cases that you need to schedule is basically the urgent one. Now, finally, the Ministry of Health in Saudi Arabia, they put some additional tips for the healthcare provider. And they mentioned that it's better to not wear a lot of accessory, like you try to avoid wearing watches, rings. You also try to avoid bringing your handbags in the, in the clinic or the hospital if possible. And sometimes you can also disinfect your uh, personal uh, belonging, like the phone and the key fobs or the, key, uh, the car keys with alcohol swab when you come back from the hospital or, or from work. You wanna make sure you, you do hand hygiene once you come back uh, from work. And what you do is 
immediately you have to take off your clothes and take a shower with the warm water and dump these clothes uh, right away to the laundry. Um, so you can be decontaminating anything that you might bring from the hospital itself. And by this, I end my talk. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed Sheikh Omar, uh, for this great talk. We're really thankful for all the tips and tricks you gave us to protect ourselves as uh, health uh, or spine care practitioners. I would uh, uh, encourage all the attendees uh, type in their questions and answers in the Q and A tab below the uh, the, uh, the the screen. And for now, while you type this in, I'm gonna use the poll for two questions. I would like uh, to gather some information uh, for the uh, attendees where they are coming from. So Bilal, if you would like to uh, put the first poll in. So you are joining this webinar from which part of the world? So you can pick one answer. Okay, I think uh, that's more than enough time, Bilal, if you can pull up the answers. Okay, so most of us are attending from the Middle East. We have about 20% from Asia, and that's probably the the uh, results for the first question okay so we have a second question and already had this has been answered as well okay that's great okay uh meanwhile i'm gonna try to get the questions for dr muhammad sheikh omar um, okay so there is a question by dr bandar hadamish uh, to dr muhammad sheikh omar so, Dr. Mohammed, if you would like to uh, turn your mic. So, the question is, is there any recommendations for surgeons when they perform emergency procedures? So, mostly your talk was about probably seeing patients as an outpatient setting. So, this question is uh, concerning uh, probably recommendations and precautions within the operating room. Yeah. So, you want to give us your tips regarding that please yeah thank you dr Fahad. that's actually an important question so um, when you perform um, a surgical operation you divide your cases into two types either <clears throat> a non-suspected case or a suspected case once you talk about suspected case then you're talking about high risk patient then even in doubt if there is any chance that the patient has possibly or potentially a COVID. 19 that's based on the symptoms or epidemiological link so not only the symptoms even epidemiological link you have to suspect covid because we mentioned that there are some mild cases and asymptomatic cases when you talk about suspected case you need to make a full precaution you put you, you put the patient in a negative pressure room probably you need a hepa filter in the or you do uh, an n95 mask for all the uh, the, all the operating theater uh, members. You do full PPEs, including the first shield. Those are for the suspected cases. Now, if you don't, if, if you're talking about non-suspected cases, then you apply all the regular precautions that when you do to the, um, to, the, um, to, the, to the patient in general. So that's where you, you have to wear the mask I prefer to wear even the goggles if you have it in your facility and the other PPEs, of course. Yeah. So any specific extra precautions in suspected or confirmed COVID-19? So you just mentioned the goggles. 
and prob probably the PPE, but th is there any other like special tips and tricks for surgeons or even anesthetists when they intubate or when we operate and how to decrease the risk of contamination or exposure to the virus? So the most proper, yeah, I mean, the most proper steps is how to perform donning and doffing. So this is important. And regarding the PPEs, is basically you do a contact precaution plus the airborne precaution, if you're talking about suspected case. Airborne precaution, you, you, you're talking about a negative pressure room and placing an N95 mask. Uh, but other than that, there is no extra um, uh, tips or uh, tricks to, to do the, such a procedure. So you're talking about examining the patient or doing a procedure in a suspected case, better to do it in an airborne precaution plus contact precaution. Okay, so there are a lot of questions over here. I'm gonna go one by one. So there is a question about, um, uh, so if you operated on a patient who is a confirmed uh, COVID-19 patient, as a healthcare practitioner, do I have to get tested after I finish the procedure or no? So yeah, so that's basically, we divide those cases based on the risk. If your risk is low, that means you're taking all the precaution. So if you're wearing the mask, you're wearing all the full PPE, you did not break this PPE in the steps wise, then probably you don't need to be tested. If you break this PPE, if you did not do a proper donning or doffing techniques, then after that, you need to be quarantined and then testing before and after you come back to work. But when encountering any suspected case, whenever you do the full precaution that is implemented within the facility, then you don't need to be tested. Okay. Um, so, so there is another question. So what are the recent guidelines regarding an asymptomatic patients? asked to sit at home for 14 days without any admission to hospital due to the high number of cases at poor countries. Are this, are this is, a va are, uh, is this still like a valid guideline and recommendation? So when we talk about asymptomatic patient, you have to talk about epidemiological link. So we quarantine patient who came back from abroad, for example, okay. for 14 days. We quarantine patient who had and unprotected um, exposure to a confirmed cases. Um, um, but other than that, we cannot do a 14 days quarantine for everyone because asymptomatic carrier is basically is, is a nightmare for this disease. But uh, as of now, you have to have an epidemiological link whether an exposure to a cases or even some facilities, they do um, uh, um, a 14 days for uh, the healthcare provider who has, who's dealing with COVID-19 cases on a daily basis. So not for one case, but those COVID team, for example, we may, um, uh, it's better to, um, to put the patient for um, uh, quarantine 14 days after they finish their um, duties, after, uh, after they finish the course of the duties. Yeah. Okay, so um, there is also an important question. So I know for a fact that in North America, they test all surgical cases. So is it recommended to test all semi-urgent or urgent cases for COVID-19? Let's say urgent, you're gonna operate anyhow and take your full precautions, but semi-urgent cases, is it recommended to do the COVID testing for all cases who are gonna get operated in a few days? Well, I thought that's a good question. Um, so I think this will emerge in our country. We don't have recommendation yet, but I think with the community spread, for example, in Jeddah and Riyadh, when doing, for example, an elective procedure, not elective, but scheduled operation, I think it's reasonable. It's not a bad idea to do the testing before the surgery, because when you do the testing, you're going to even do an action to that testing. So you're gonna perform an airborne precaution rather than uh, only a contact or droplet precaution. So I think that's gonna be something 
uh, maybe is going to be implemented in the next uh, few weeks. Okay. Um, so, is there any evidence that uh, COVID nineteen can be transmitted uh, can transmit it via blood uh, during surgeries, like HIV, for example, or it's just through uh, droplets? Right. There is no evidence. Um, so, what happens? There is some patient they're they're testing positive. PCR in the blood. And there are some patients even tested in the stool. So we know that this is a, 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 not a viable virus. This is a PCR, this is the DNA material. But we don't know if this are viable virus that can be transmitted to other patients. There are no single case report from um, a, a GI transmission, a fecal oral or blood, uh, blood transmission. Okay, so there is a lot of questions. I think it's a very important topic, so I'm going to just take more time in this. So there is also, I, uh, I, I've attended recent seminars, and there is also an asked question by uh, uh, Ta'zim Hussein asking about, is it recommended to use the negative pressure operating rooms or the HEPA filter is enough? So if you have in your facility a negative pressure room, that's going to be amazing. But most of the facility, they will just apply a HIPAA filter, which is enough. Because when we talk about the COVID-19, there are no documented clinical evidence now until now, clinical evidence that the disease can be transmitted as an airborne. So when we talk about airborne, this is an extra step for a potential um, airborne precaution. We know that the PCR of the virus can be present in air, but we don't know if this is a viable virus again. And there is no single um, study that document or give this answer clear that this, air, this is an airborne virus. So airborne is an extra step. Uh, some facility, they don't have the resources to do so. And they put the patient on a droplet precaution and that's it. And this is nothing wrong. As we mentioned in the CDC guidelines, they still recommend an alternative option to, um, to be a droplet precaution. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think I'm going to be gathering some of those questions, plot it, plotting it down. I think we're going to move to our next talk for now. Uh, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Naif bin Dajam, who is working as a spine surgeon in King Abdullah Medical City in Makkah al Mukarramah. Uh, Dr. Naif completed his uh, uh, orthopedic training in Canada and then he did two uh, spine fellowships in the States, including Mayo Clinic and Johns Hopkins. He's going to be talking about spondylodiscitis. So, Dr. Naif, please go ahead. So, can you guys hear me? Okay. So, uh, I'm going to be talking about spinal discitis, which is, to me, way better than talking about COVID. Um, something we're familiar with, something we uh, uh, practice uh, on a monthly basis, if not on a weekly basis. So my talk is going to be talking about incidence etiology and risk factors, pathophysiology, clinical and radiographic assessment, and then uh, microbiology and the treatment, uh, including non-surgical and surgical. So now I've just uh, select the presenter mode, if you don't mind, so we can see the, the slide. This one. This interview. Can you see? Is it good, bad? Uh, we still don't see it. So maybe click on it again. It's not sure. Let me share again. Yes, perfect. Go ahead. Sorry. For that. So uh, the outlines, as you can see, uh, the incident. I'm just going to be zipping through all of these slides. Mostly the first ones, uh, as all of us know, all of these uh, introductory uh, you know, packs. But basically, the incidence of novel um, spinal infection is about average of 5% with a mortality uh, up to 15%. Uh, the key point or message in this slide, it's a bimodal distribution. It's commonly seen in patients below than 20 years and in those patients at uh, average of 60 years. 
due to specific uh, anatomical and uh, patient-specific characters. Etiology, the most common organism is the Staph aureus, as we all know. And then they're like specific uh, organism related to patient characteristics. So if you have somebody with IV drug abuse, then probably unlikely we'll see a gram negative pass alive. Immunocompromised patients, you can see the whole spectrum, including TB, pseudomonas, and uh, even fungal infections. Sickle cell anemia, still the staph aureus is the most common in sicklers, but salmonella has been associated with sickler patients. And then penetrating injury, including anaerobic bacteria. Um, classifications, you can go based on the duration, uh, acute, subacute, chronic. You can go based on anatomical uh, location, if it's a uh, disc or vertebral uh, uh, body or the paraspinal or surrounding tissues. And then you can always classify, classify, classify based on pathogen and the route of infection. People at risk, including patients at the average of uh, 50 years or 60 years of age, uh, patients with uh, comorbidities, including diabetes, uh, especially in about 25% in some series shows those patients are at risk of having uh, 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 spinal discitis. And if you have an involvement of other organs like uh, abdominal abscesses, respiratory and UTI, and then usage of steroids, drug abuse, and uh, having dental infection, distraction, extraction, as well as uh, rheumatoid patients. This table has been taken from Dr. Benzel's uh, textbook of spine, uh, shows all of these patients at risk. So basically any immunocompromised patient, any patient goes for chemotherapy, oncology, but I would like to draw your attention, renal and hepatic failures are really nasty um, pathologies to have in your patients when they have an infection because that limits all of your options, especially with surgical ones. The pathophysiology, most commonly hematogenous seating, and then uh, less commonly, the local spread between the organs around the pelvic area, especially in the lumbar spine, that's where most of the uh, spinal discitis is found. And uh, other uh, very rare cause is the direct inoculation, like bullets, stabbing, and something iatrogenic like discography or uh, uh, chemonegal lysis. Multiple theories, most commonly known and identified based on studies, the Venus uh, theory. So basically, if you can look at here, the brain is connected to the spine, to the pelvis, with valveless venous system. So there is no valve. So everything drained from here goes up to the heart, doesn't have any valve. So as you can see from close proximity, having the pelvis as a source of UTI, most commonly causing uh, lumbar spondylitis chiris, most common location makes sense, but that's my um, theory and, and think of that. Uh, it's not like for them. The arterial theory, especially in pediatrics, if you can look at the spine and the vertebral spine here, in pediatrics, the arteries are not. Um, so, so basically, if you look at the disc space here in pediatrics, the arteries or arterioles are still connected to the disc space. But as the patient or the uh, normal people mature, the end plates will be closed and there's no continuity between the arteries and the disc space and that hence decreases the, um, the oxygen tension as well as minimize the oxygen percentages in the disc space and hence uh, um, uh, render them to uh, most common source of infection in the disc space. The natural history from based on biogenic infection uh, is the end plate capillary lobing seeding and then it goes to suppurative inflammatory process and then it goes uh, anatomically either anterior or longitudinal up and down or goes posterior to the meninges and epidural abscesses. The history, um, you have to be very suspicious about patients with isolated back pain in the elderly because very likely um, some of them will have a source of infection. The other thing having comorbidities. And the third thing is having that kid, that age group in the other extreme uh, putting them all at risk of having uh, an asymptomatic uh, um, spondylar discitis, meaning they could have a spondylar discitis going for months without noting until it becomes like uh, destabilizing or bothersome to them in the form of back or neck pain. About 50% of those patients will have the constitutional symptoms, uh, as we all know, of these uh, complaints of constitutional symptoms, but it's not always the uh, most common presentation. 
uh, hints or uh, uh, clues in those patients having a sudden unwilling uh, to wait for, as well as having uh, power spinal spasm, especially in the neck. Some of them, if you were talking about cervical level, some of them, some of them will have dysphagia and pain and spasm in their neck related to the movement. Radiographic assessment, uh, as we all do, the uh, x-rays is the way to go. Unfortunately, in the plain x-rays, it doesn't show any abnormalities or changes until about three weeks from the initial presentation of the active infection. But the radiographic phenomena or the pathognomic finding in the images is the loss of the uh, in the plates on both level or those involved, as well as loss of the height of the vertebral disc. Mostly and clearer on the CT more than the uh, uh, plain x-rays. As you can see, this is a pathognomic finding. And this is a common MCQ question. Having infection is, is losing of the end plate, and that's the, uh, among other cascade uh, elements, but that's the most striking thing you can see. You can see in the MRI uh, involvement of the disc and this, uh, the vertebral body above and below, and if there's any element anterior or posterior to that. Don't miss the paravertebral spine collections. Uh, this is another one that shows the source of infection is the, in the thoracic level, actually, not only in the spine. Radiographic assessment, including the nuclear spine, um, technetium, gallium, label leukocyte. Label leukocyte, or the white blood cell, from my understanding from some of the radiologists is used to show the chronicity of the infection. So basically in the spine, you can have an isolated uh, epidural abscess or a spondyl dyskiris, but the, the, these nuclear Im uh, images will show you the mega scale. They show you the whole spine. If there's any other sources that's seeding uh, the infection to the spine or the, to, to some uh, extremities. Uh, MRI is the gold standard uh, to show you the um, involvement of the abscesses anterior and the involvement of the vertebral body. Um, this is a very good uh, table that I've taken from Dr. Benzel's book today. Um, it's really good to show you the difference between the biogenic spinal discatus and show you the tuberculous um, or non-biogenic as well as the degenerative changes and the differences between all of these three compared to the, all of these variables, the involvement of the spine, the disc involvement, the paraspinal, I think it's very good to show uh, and learn from those uh, elements, especially in the uh, level of residency, and it shows you the difference between all of these. This is a study or guidelines has been uh, established um, in 2015. Uh, I had the privilege to work with one of the authors, Dr. Ha Paul Huddleston from Mayo Clinic, has been involved in this and shows you the native vertebral osteomyelitis in adults and how to approach it. It's very good if you would like to go over it. Due to the time limitation, I cannot go over it uh, in details. The treatment, the aim of the goals, the aims justify the goals and the, aim, the means to go, uh, and, uh, go after the infection. So the goal of the um, treatment is to eradicate the source of infection, not only in the spine, but if you have an endocarditis, for example, when you're treating these patients, you need to make sure it's not, you're not only treating the spine, you need to make sure there is no other sources and there's no other sequelae of that infection. Because if you treat them, it might come back uh, and uh, get more aggressive. You'd like to relieve the pain, reverse neurological deficit, and maintain stability, and prevent uh, any development of uh, deformity. Non-operative is the mainstay of treatment. If the patient is not sick, you need to hold the antibiotic until you get uh, a as um, an organism, per personally and from my own training, you can always argue against this. I like to get a biopsy in each one of them. I know the staph aureus is the most common, but I don't want to spend like six weeks or 12 weeks trying to treat my patient and I'm not covering that patient properly, especially when some patients have issues with the compliance. So I like always to start with the biopsy, get a good organism, make sure you're treating the uh, right organism, and accordingly you can choose the antibiotics. Um, then typically we go with the IV antibiotics for six weeks until uh, uh, inflammatory markers are reduced or normalized. Um, if that doesn't get lower, then you can always extend either with the continuation of the IV antibiotic or you can switch to oral. There are like certain indications to switch to your oral. I'm not in a position to talk about that. But the other thing is if you have a prostate loss is the length of treatment in those patients about three months. This is a biogenic uh, uh, vertebral osteomyelitis study. This is like a landmark study. This author, Eugene Kariji, is like one of the big names in spine surgery who has been establishing a lot 
of infection in the spine, like ESR and CRP and all of these things. If you have any of your patients who's having some of these or all of these factors, that means you're having a good, um, favorable uh, response to the non-operative. When you go for surgery, when your non-operative fails or there's a um, collection that needs to be drained, or if you have an, an element of the neural spine has been compromised, or if you're concerned about deformity and you would like to maintain stability. This is an MRI with gadolinium for the cervical spine. As you can see, the discs involved and it goes beyond. If you look at this cross-sectional or axial cut, it shows how significant uh, the lesion is and how the, the, the inner side of the lesion is like, would not go with antibiotic based on uh, some articles. So in, in, in my, my limited experience, I would say, and from what I've seen in my fellowship, this kind of lesion approach from anterior corpectomy, you can use a cage, you can use structural bone graft, and then you can stage it to second um, uh, stage, like why go posterior, but that's a controversy. I don't want to spend time on it. This is how this patient looks like after putting a structural bone graft with, um, with the um, uh, instrumentation. You need to make sure in order to, for infection to be eradicated very well, you need to stabilize the spine to some extent. If the spine is not stable, the likelihood of having infection eradicated is very limited. Uh, this is an example of having deformity. Um, you can place a cage and uh, an instrumentation uh, above and below. This is of those uh, lesions. You do want to spend time and sit on it because if you're involved in this guy, this patient, you need to do at least like two or three levels correct team instrumentation above and below. Some studies go against and some others go with putting instrumentation acutely an instrument, uh, like putting a cage and then an instrument above and below, you can go either ways. Every study uh, is fighting for the own rationale, but um, I, I like to wait for antibiotic to clear, like eradicate everything and then I instrument based on my level of comfort. This is a study shows that you can go for, like if you have a vertebral spine in the um, infection in the spine, then uh, most of the anterior only for the cervical spine, and then you can go uh, posterior or all posterior approach to the thoracolumbar spine. Uh, also, they mentioned the increase in invasiveness with two procedures did not increase the mortality. Actually, it's better sometimes to go, especially in the cervical spine or if the spine is not stable. The presence of the instrumentation um, did not prevent the body from fighting the infection. So that's a comfort zone for somebody who would like to instrument in the acute uh, setting. Uh, but uh, it's always a surgeon's preference and always um, a discussion with the patient. Um, in this study, the patient said um, you can perform uh, an instrumentation again in the setting of a spinal infection, and that depends on the aggressiveness of the debridement. And that's one of the bad things. If you're going acutely from my own thinking, you're going to deprive a lot of soft tissue, which could be reossified if you treat them with the antibiotic and wait and give it some time because the body will help you to some extent. This is a study I found interesting is using the hyperbaric oxygen therapy in those patients with osteomyelitis. This is a common approach uh, way of doing it in uh, ankles and other extremities, but I found this is interesting. I just want to draw your attention. It's not a common uh, standard. Uh, those are my references, and that's the Dr. Benz's spine surgery book, which I really admire and uh, recommend keeping as a source. That's it. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Nye, for the great talk. Um, so there is uh, only one question from the uh, audience. Uh, if you get a positive blood culture, would you still go for a tissue biopsy? I think the answer is no. Um, and there is another question also talking about, did you uh, go across any studies correlating discitis and COVID-19 at the moment or recently? No, unfortunately, I'm not. I haven't. Well, Dr. Mohammed Sheikh Omar. Mohammed. He's muted. Dr. Mohammed. So maybe we need to unmute. Yeah, Dr. Mohammed, I don't know if you heard the question. No, can you repeat it, please? Yeah. So, did you come across any study? Uh, um, about discitis and COVID-19 patient? 
Um, not of my knowledge, actually, no. I never okay. came across. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Um, what's the usual, what type of bone scan do you recommend if you're suspecting spondylodiscitis, Mohammed? Me, like as initial workup? Yeah. I would go the CT scan first. Okay. Um, and then okay. if that's satisfactory to me and it's suggestive clinically and radiographically, then I'll go ahead and treat. Perfect. If it doesn't and I'm suspicious, and you can see that sometimes, the radiology report will show you um, that this is suggestive infection, you biopsy it, you find it negative, then I'll go for a bone scan actually. That will show you more a bigger picture. Okay. So let me. Uh, uh, point a single question to both of you, Naif and Mohammed. Um, we always have this debate between the ID team and the spine uh, team. So sometimes you get uh, stuck with those patients who are complicated with multiple uh, INDs due to a deep infection. And always you have this debate that the IT, ID team wants the spine team to remove all the hardware and the spine surgeon is reluctant to do that. So maybe we can reach a common uh, uh, consensus regarding that matter. I would like to hear from Dr. Muhammad first. Uh, what are his views and maybe what are the indications or absolute indications for him to remove hardware? And, I'll add, and then we can hear from Dr. Naif. Yeah, so yeah, that's actually a, a very complicated question, I would say. Um, so when we take a when we talk about the spinal infection and the presence of hardware together with the infection, we always have to mention two things. The first thing is what type of organism that I am dealing with. Because if I'm dealing with a staph aureus, for example, the staph aureus has these biofilms. When it's there, we know it's not going to go away, even with antibiotics because it's just like a biofilm with the hardware. It means that it's gonna present for years. So sometimes we, if, if there is some, like some situation we cannot operate on, then we put them on suppressive therapy. If uh, let's say it's difficult to remove the hardware. Now when we talk about fungal infection, also fungal infection is very difficult to treat. So those type of cases, we need to um, remove those hardwares. Mycobacterium infection, tuberculosis also is another um, topic where we cannot treat sometimes with antimicrobial solo in the presence of hardware. So that's the main indication. And the other indication is when we treat, of course, medical treatment and we see failure of treatment. So you give the, the, the patient um, uh, an antimicrobial therapy for months and you don't see any improvement then that's we, we, we go. But usually the, the gray area between the infectious disease and orthopedics and the spine surgeon is based on the organism rather than the uh, other thing. Yeah. Any comment I, now? I, I totally agree. Um, I think that's a broad question and really difficult to answer and, and multiple factors plays into uh, answering this question. The patient's uh, comorbidities, the compliance, um, how many levels did the patient fuse or not? But I agree with you, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Is if the patient comes with an infection about three months or more, and I'm thinking that the infection is the source in the spine, I would just go back, remove everything, re-instrument again. As you mentioned, the biofilm is the key thing. I'm just treating this as an arthroplasty in the hip or knee. Um, the antibiotic will not penetrate the biofilm, so you need to remove everything, excessive uh, deprivement, and then instrument again, and hoping that will work. I've never seen anybody who removes except one case in my fellowship, but that was a really nasty case. Uh, the patient was an IP drug abuser, so it was not like, the best thing. But if you have to remove the instrumentation, the other alternative is to put the patient in a, a TLSO or like a cast for a few weeks until you eradicate the antibiotic with the uh, eradicate the infection with the antibiotic and then you can always re-instrument again. But that's uh, my way of looking at it. Okay, um, I would like to add a comment. It's not a question to Dr. Muhammad. Um, do you think the time frame plays a role? I think in the arthroplasty literature, we have the cutoff of three weeks usually for the biofilm to form. Uh, do you think that 
applies on spine as well or is there a number in your in your head that we should stick to when talking about the biofilm and, instru and instrumentation yeah of course the biofilm usually you're gonna you're gonna find the biofilm um, guidelines basically in all recommendation of prosthetic material e either like a, a knee replacement or a hip replacement and the cutoff usually Mo less than one month so usually less than four to three weeks that's we call it acute and we can treat with um, uh, with antibiotic solo and then we talk about three uh, sorry one month to three to three months and this is kind of intermediate but more than three months we really talk about like a, a, a biofilm that already formed and sometimes it's difficult to, to um, eradicate yeah Okay, so a question from Dr. Suleimani. So if you have a referred patient from other service and the patient is already started on antibiotics, how does that affect the biopsy and culture results, Dr. Mohammed? So yeah, um, so basically if you're talking about a biopsy from the, um, from the, from the, infect, from the infected um, uh, tissue, you should have a high yield, even if you have started the antibiotic within 48 to 72 hours. So starting antibiotic, when the patient, when you, when you have a patient empirically and you're going to operate at the case in 72 hours, it's not a big deal because we worry, we, we usually start empirical treatment based on the site of the infection. And we don't want to play with the spine because delaying antibiotic could be um, could associated with increasing morbidity and uh, and disability. So starting empirical antibiotic, it's not nothing wrong. Even if you don't get the tissue biopsy for culture, it's fine. You can treat empirically. Sometimes we do a PCR technique to identify the organism. But even if you don't find any single organism, then you treat empirically for the most likely organism. Okay. So there is a nice question for, for the panel. Any role for procalcitonin, fibrin level, and d dimer in the diagnosis of spondylodiscitis? No. It could be, but um, practically I haven't done it or seen it. Dr. Mohammed, I've never heard about that, to be honest, but about, what about Dr. Mohammed? No, there is no, um, no single guidelines recommend using procalcitonin up to date. We don't know in future if this will be a useful um, technique, but up to date, we don't have any uh, recommendation from any guidelines. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Nai, for the great talk. I think we're going to be moving forward to the next topic, uh, and our next speaker, Dr. Khalid Madani, who is a spine surgeon at uh, King Fahad General Hospital in Jeddah. Uh, he did his uh, fellowship um, uh, in spine surgery in Canada. So I would like to welcome him, and he's going to be talking about. Uh, granulomatous spinal infection. So go ahead, Dr. Khaled. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fahad, uh, for this invitation. And I'd like to thank also Saudi Spine Society to give me these opportunities. So my talk will be uh, today as uh, for TB spine. So as we know, the TB spine is one of the most uh, top infectious killer in the world and it's been coming since long time. And in 2018, it shows as 1.5 million people died from the TB. And most uh, important that HIV, it's 250,000 people has been died from this fair TB cases. So Although the, the number has been decreased from 2015 until to 2018, it's getting like one to two percent is improvement in the, in the time of the percentage, but still it's considered is one of the high infectious disease. As we see, this is a world map, it's showing estimated TB death in the per 100,000 people. Uh, if you see the Africa and the South Asia, uh, region is showing the highest number, although the other regions like in South America, it's also there is considered and some, some area of the 
East Asia, also there is some high number of deaths shown there. So MOH uh, carry out the preventive uh, uh, general uh, TB cases and it tr to treat all the patients and to eradicate uh, the TB by giving medications and if any surgical cases need to be referred and to be treated as well and they give some guidelines and they give some also instruction to patients to go ahead through and read this you know booklets so the spine column involvement is less than one to two percent in all cases in tuberculosis extra pulmonary TB present about ten percent of cases which in half is involved in MSK Spinal TB is more common in young and children, and it's considered as a disease of poverty. So pot disease, or called abscess, you could call any um, abbreviations. So it goes as a TB. It's affecting more than one vertebra. The interior aspect of the vertebral body is adjacent to the subchondral plate is commonly involved. Progressive bone destruction leading to the vertebral collapse and kyphosis, which can lead you to neurological deficit and spinal deformity. So there is factors in these cases are uh, mainly it's a poverty areas and poor access to the health facilities HIV cases are more common aging old people's also is common alcoholism diabetes males chronic peritoneal dialysis uh, transplantation patients under patients that are going for chemotherapy and imprisonments we have a, a very high numbers that we used to receive from prisons due to you know, a lack of ventilations and uh, crowded you know areas so they, they have some type of uh, tbs they can present previous tb infection and smoking is 20 percent uh this table is showing um if you want to between tuberculosis versus biogenic, so it's a good table to, to distinguish between the two. The bone destruction is really high in tuberculosis, about 75%. Thoracic is the main area of involvement, but it can also show in other areas. But in vertebral body involvement, usually you see two or three vertebral bodies involvement. Uh, this uh, you in the earliest type of the disease, you see the, the disc as spirit as compared to the pyogenic, the disc involvement as early. And plus, uh, you see well-defined vertebral collections, and there are thin, smooth, well uh, abscess, uh, and paravertebral para interosseous abscess, and plus, the, you see more vertebral body involvement. So clinical manifestation of pyogenic versus uh, tuberculous spondylitis, uh, back pain usually are common in and particular pain is more in pyogenic and neurological both are common case pyogenic tuberculosis fever uh, mainly in pyogenic less in tuberculosis average time of diagnosis usually so clinical features are uh, usually it's a uh, onset is insidious typical progressive over four to eleven months weight loss fatigue orexia night sweats generalized aches, axial pain. Uh, you, in late cases, you see spinal problems as a gibbous and paraspinal abscess. Diagnosis goes through the blood investigations like CBC. You do uh, differential, you see lymphocytosis. However, it's not much common. WBC, it's maybe it could be normal. ESR and CRP could be high. Biopsy, it's good for all the cases of infections to, do, to rule out infection versus tumor. You do culture for TB, but usually takes six weeks for acid fast bacilli. There are also another medium, it's called middle broad medium. It can give you a diagnosis early in four days. Histology, when you do histology, you see 60% of cases, you caseate in granuloma, giant cells, and AFP, as in the picture on the right side. PCR, 90% is specific and 95% is sensitive. You also can request interferon gamma from the blood. It shows about 85 to 95% uh, positive in 24 hours. Imaging uh, x rays, one of the first tools you usually request, and um, usually it doesn't show in the early stage, but in the late stages, it can show some like a physiform shadow. It's a double shadow behind the cardiac. You that would suspect there's some type of uh, collections happening around the vertebra. The lateral x rays also you see some of the body. 
you can request CT scan and uh, CT scan will show you a different type of the lesions like I'll show in the picture here, like uh, at the level of the disc or could be some type multi-level involvement or some type of uh, sclerosis or some in the body uh, gases or in the, in the collection you'll see some uh, calcification as well. CT myelogram when you cannot do MRI or CT scan with the contrast it will show you some more enhancement over the collection area. MRI is the one of the best tool to diagnose for uh, the you know, early infection like a TB. You have to do a whole spine uh, MRI to look for the skip lesions and treat more effectively before significant neurological deficit develop. This uh, tables also show and you can request uh, like a bone scan and but it's sensitive but it's not uh, specific and PET scan, CT scan also can show some type of uh, differentiation between the, the tumor infection but however it's expensive and it's limited avail availabilities in the centers. So our treatment goes basically uh, it's a medical and surgical treatment but the main state is a medical treatment so you have to start any cases with them. Um, TB medications uh, for drugs to be given, isonide, rifampicin, ethambutol, pyrazinamide. WHO recommend for uh, two months for drugs. And another uh, phase for nine months goes for two drugs. However, we have to know the drugs resistant about five to 10% uh, in these cases. So you have to contact ID to start the second line treatment. MRI finding in blood disease and correlating clinical progress with the radiological findings. So whenever you have a TB spine cases, you want to know as patients, uh, do, we need, do we need to repeat the MRI and see here how much is improving? Is getting, however, in this, uh, in this diagram showing, you, much, you don't see the much uh, improvement in MRI in the early stage until month of nine and onward, you will see the, the, some you know, improvement in the MRI series. However, the clinical pictures will show you a great improvement from this in the month of the start of month three. So the indication for surgical uh, in the case of a spine TB will go for the open biopsy, especially when you have a percutaneous uh, radiological fail that didn't show the inadequate uh, samples. So you have to do open biopsy in these cases and relieve the compression of the spinal cord, especially when you have a uh, compression of the spinal cord presented with a neurological deficit. So decompression will be effective and correct the kyphosis when they have a collapse of uh, one or two vertebrae, and you need to correct all this kyphosis and large abscess evacuation. Uh, approach can go uh, different ways. Um, one of the cases, if you have an thoracic, you can go either from posterior, just the only decompression, by laminectomies, or if you have a large abscess, a collection in the interior vertebral body, you can address either from interior by thoracotomy or in the lumbar by retroperitoneal, or you can approach through the post lateral approach. You go by the excision of the ribs and um, go through the lateral and you excise and evacuate all the abscess and decompress of the spinal cord, and you can put over a cage from the, one, uh, from the post lateral side. As it's showing is here, because you can go from interior by thoracotomy and put the cage and uh, or um, strut uh, graft with the fixation. If you have in cervical um, abscess collections, you can go directly from the interior and evacuate all and uh, remove all the abscess from the interior and put your plate and cage. However, the prognosis is generally good. In this case, finally, almost all the patients have a relief of pain and improved neurological deficit. Even patients with no sensory motor function below the lesion usually improve uh, below the level of injury naturally called as compression. Most patients regain mobility following the surgeries. We go through uh, three cases um, quickly, and this is a lady, 37 years old female patient, DM hypertensive hypothyroidism ischemic heart disease. She's in wheelchair since 10 months, weakness in both lower limb, Asia type C, spastic and clonus, operated one year ago in private with a MIS fixation from T1 and T2 and T4, T5 with a laminectomy T3. This is the initial uh, MRI showing there's some uh, destructive lesion at the T3 and T4 with the cord compression. 
you see over here that this has been sp spared, but two vertebrae has been involved with some collection of peritoneum. And uh, this is the initial fixation has been done one year ago. She presented to me with this uh, x-rays. I can see there is some loosening of the fixation on the distal area. And this is CT was showing uh, the, the screws has been pulled out and there are three levels of destructions. MRI shows there's a collection and compression over the cord. The power of the lower limb is one over five. Uh, we didn't know this is case could be TB, dysbiogenic, could be tumor, was one you know predated and and the and the report showing is they didn't found any type of tumor, they didn't found any even even TB infections. So she received chest only fixation decompression. So the patient went uh, through um, posterior uh, fixation, start from cervical down to thoracic uh, nine uh, with the posterolateral cage uh, application. However, we took uh, samples and we did the frozen uh, section, which showed this is non-malignant, it showed acute inflammatory cells. And uh, that was, you know, uh, and showed also, you know, clinically and interoperative, we show it showed spots coming out. So the fixation has been done so far great. And we did a decompressions and cage application from the postural laterals with fixation with triple rods. Second case, we go, this is a patient present with a, a large and the posterior aspect of the collections. And then you see some, there's a calcification over the left side, lumbar muscles area. Well, we did the MRI, they show large collection at the retroperitoneal and the posterior aspect of the muscles over the left side. You can see the axial image is a large collection. However, the, the, there's no neurological deficit in this case. He's 27 years old. He's walking, but he still is complaining of pain. You see the alignment was good. We did the MRI after uh, 10 days. We did first uh, evacuation of abscess. We evacuated the abscess, clean, clean off the area by retroperitoneal approach, small incision. We evacuated all the pus. Since 10 days, he, 10 days he, all the abscess has been evacuated and patient went with a brace. Uh, case three, this is um, another uh, thoracolumbar area. He's a prisoner and I present with a multi-levels of uh, destruction lesion and with the paraplegia at the level of thoracolumbar and with the collection. So our plan here to do, uh, because it's prolonged also in the hospitalization, the risk of infections could be higher. So we did in this case was um, MIS fixation was the good option in this case and uh, laminectomy and decompression of the core at the area of the uh, thoracolumbar. And this is the post of x-rays. We correct the kyphosis and as well as the, the, you know, the fixation has been achieved long enough. So this is my our resources um, which go through. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Khalid Madani for the great talk. Um, let me see if we have any questions from the attendees over here. So there is a question, how common is TB in Saudi Arabia? What do you think, Dr. Madani? The TB is, uh, well, uh, the high risk of cases you have to know. I mean, the, the, especially we receive patients mainly from the prison and these prison cases are, can be you know, common. And also we receive from the societies, you know, it's, it's a common case. We are, since I joined the hospital since, 14 years and I'm seeing all the spine cases coming. So usually it's a very common case. Okay. So there's a question uh, from Yusuf, uh, probably to Dr. Muhammad Sheikh Omar. Uh, if you treat a patient with an anti-TB medications or the, the, the regimen, so what's the post-op protocol? Uh, do you have to repeat the MRI uh, or you just follow clinically? And if yes, uh, when do you repeat the imaging for those patients? Well, usually we go with the medication, first of all. I mean, this medication goes by, sometime by us or sometime by ID uh, team, which we have. We, yeah. They recommend the cases to start the medication. Usually it goes for up to one year. And uh, clinical progression, we usually see within, uh, as this article showing, this, you usually see the, after, you know, the progression of improvement. You will see by after nine months. But clinically, you will see that they are improving. 
you see neurological they improve like within two weeks, three weeks they're improving. Not all cases, but I would say maybe 80 to 90 percent they improve, but 10 percent still there are some chances they are they, they don't improve at all. But there's some little improvements coming, and they are better than I think the overall prognosis of these cases as compared to pyogenic is TB is much better. Okay, yeah. what do you think? I Dr. agree with Dr. Khaled. I just want to add that point. Sometimes we, um, in cases of uh, like TB abscesses, where you drain the abscess, um, you may need to just have a follow-up imaging in those cases. But most of the cases with TB discitis, with clinical improvement, uh, yes, I agree with Dr. Khaled. We, we just go with clinical um, improvement. Okay. Um, Uh, this question is for Dr. Khaled. Why do you think there is predominance affecting the, the thoracolumbar junction in TB spine? Well, TB can show us in anywhere, actually not thoracolumbar. It's more common area than thoracic. But I've seen cases even involving the cervical, is involving the occipital cervical region, involving the lumbosacral region, L5, sacrum. It's uh, everywhere it shows, you know. Though it doesn't show even thoracolumbar area. Although it's, uh, there are some cases we saw in thoracolumbar area, but usually we treat them as, uh, as you know, the principle where either you need to go decompress the spinal cord, you want to evacuate the abscess, or you want to correct the kyphosis as well. Okay. So great. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Khalid Madani, for the great talk. Now we're going to be moving to our uh, last speaker, uh, Dr. Shadi Shahata. Uh, who is a spine surgeon working at Mahfasal uh, Clinic. Um, he's going to be talking about uh, updates in the uh, diagnosis and the management of the post-operative spinal infections. So, uh, Dr. Shadi, please, uh, you can share your screen and uh, you can start the talk. Bismillah, assalamu alaikum. Dr. Fahad? Wadah, wadah. Loud and clear. You can go ahead, Shadi. Excellent. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for attending uh, this uh, first uh, webinar from the Western region at uh, such a late hour. Uh, second of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Fahad Abdel-Jabbar for borrowing, borrowing most of his uh, slides that he presented in Hawaii in 2019. So uh, we'll be talking about updates and diagnosis and management of uh, post-operative spinal infection. Uh, this is uh, very important to face, uh, to know, uh, to face cases such as uh, this one, a patient I operated upon uh, about a month and a half ago, 73-year-old, uh, type 2 diabetes uh, operation went extremely well until he presented uh, two weeks after surgery with intense pain. So we'll go over the objectives, uh, speak a little bit of uh, epidemiology, risk factors, clinical presentation, uh, uh, how to evaluate patients, uh, what to focus on in imaging, uh, some classifications that are proposed by studies, and uh, overall principles of uh, management. So why is this important? Well, it's the most common complication following any spinal surgery. And this causes uh, significant morbidity uh, to patients, and of course, uh, it has a very heavy burden on the uh, patient and the society, financial burden. Right. Incidence varies from 0.5 to 20 percent. Such variation depends on whether you have instrumentation, it goes up to 3 percent. Uh, no instrumentation, I mean 3 percent, and if there is an instrumentation, the suggested uh, uh, morbidity or risk of infection is uh, tw uh, more than 12 percent, can reach more than 12 percent. Okay, and it goes higher for trauma patients. Uh, risk factors, several studies try to uh, cluster these factors and they're grouped into patients factors, surgical factors, surgical environment factors. Uh, modifiable risk factors such as smoking, obesity, um, OR time, if you have a, a skilled team, expert team, uh, usage of prolonged foleys, uh, length of stay, and malnutrition, non-modifiable, such are, such are uh, patients who are uh, older in age or are immunocompromised or have other comorbidities. Uh, points that we should remember in surgical environment, the prepping, the draping, try to standardize everything. The, true, the room traffic, no, uh, number of personnel, 
uh, contaminated instruments and the usage of uh, intraoperative uh, fluoroscopy. Um, this uh, study uh, was an important uh, review article uh, that looked into uh, what's new in the diagnosis and prevention of surgical site infection. And among the very important risk factors that uh, would uh, subject patients to having uh, a high risk of uh, surgical site infection, it was noticed that patients who had neurological disorder, whether in cervical or thoracolumbar lumbar spine, were, had at least two to three times the odds of acquiring infection. Uh, and amongst uh, the other stuff that uh, is potentially contaminated, uh, see arms, scrubs, gown, your everyday instrument that you have in your OR. Clinical presentation, fever, not surprisingly, it's only in 26% of the patients. Pain is probably amongst the most important, particularly when the patient has delayed presentation uh, three to four weeks after surgery. Erythema and drainage uh, with probably the most important, particularly wound drainage is like available in 60 plus percent uh, of patients who had uh, just an acute uh, infection. Patients also present with hardware failure loosening, and some present with neurological signs and symptoms. Last, CBC, not very reliable. It's only elevated in 50% of the patients. ESR, you have to uh, know that the normal ESR, uh, ESR goes back to normal in four to six weeks, while CRP goes back probably in one or two weeks. Uh, blood cultures, better taken by biopsy, uh, better taken by CT guide biopsy and, and uh, or fluoro. Serial labs are supposed to be taken as well. Uh, imaging, plain x-rays, are they helpful? Not in the first four weeks. Uh, this case showing that uh, you don't see the normal marks of the uh, vertebral body and uh, you can uh, clearly distinguish the disc space. And it takes time for this to develop. And like mentioned before, uh, loosening can happen or, or uh, breakage of the hardware, and this would take time as well. It would not happen acutely, and it's uh, in this particular case uh, due to fatigue or osteola or loosening of the hardware. CT scan can show the lytic uh, lesion as seen in the axial cuts here as well as in the sagittal cuts. However, I myself and many I know uh, would rely on MRI as it's highly sensitive and highly specific. Uh, you can detect an epidural abscess, and you can also identify uh, hyperintensity. Uh, with hyperintensity, you can see signs of infection, whether in the disc space uh, or uh, surrounding soft tissue, paravertebral soft tissue. Uh, such as in, in this case, you can see this patient had an L2, L3 microdiscectomy, and there is a collection. And if you look at the T1 with the uh, uh, contrast, you can see some ring enhancement here. It's more clear on this side. Um, again, uh, if you can do an MRI, it will clearly show also with the contrast, the difference between having a normal degenerative change and also an enhancement and uh, masking of the normal intervertebral space uh, due to infection. Other, uh, other updates, uh, well, other studies that I personally don't uh, use and it should be limited to really challenging cases are such as uh, 18 uh, FDG uh, PET scan and bone scan. Uh, the uh, PET scan was shown to be superior to MRI. However, like I said, it should be restricted to challenging cases. Classification according to the location. You're either dealing with a superficial wound infection uh, or, uh, or deep, or according to timing, whether it's an acute or chronic. Then you have whether you have a severe infection or a, uh, you, you treat uh, superficial, sorry, severity, you either have a superficial or deep with a single organism. With those cases, probably do an IND with primary closure. You're either dealing with it or you're dealing with a deep infection with multiple organism, an average of three I, uh, INDs. The other thing, deep infection and uh, myonecrosis, multiple or multi-resistant organism, and those cases are challenging and very difficult, and usually you have poor outcome. What about host response? You either have a, have a normal immune system, or you have patients with multi, uh, 
uh, multiple comorbidities as on top of smoking, uh, or you have the immunocompromised severe, severely malnourished. Uh, uh, management principles, focus on early diagnosis, have a high index of suspicion, and appropriate medical and surgical management, obtain a stable closure, involve an ID team uh, for best antibiotic selection, restore mechanical integrity of the spine. Further to management, uh, early presentation. Early presenting infections are generally the result of more virulent organisms, and they're not so common. Uh, delayed infections are typically caused by low virulence organisms such as uh, skin flora. Always send samples for cultures and sensitivity. Uh, if you had a superficial stitch abscess, maybe antibiotics for two weeks is sufficient. If you had deep infection, IND, IV antibiotics for six weeks, not like prior, they used to say two weeks and then completed with uh, oral antibiotic. Now, uh, most studies would recommend having six weeks of IV antibiotics followed by uh, six weeks of oral antibiotics or a total of three months of IV antibiotic. Uh, if you had a superficial uh, plus or minus deep infection, explore, your patient, uh, explore the incision, uh, take samples for gram stain, do IND bone graft, what do you do with that, what do you do with the hardware, are all questions that we all uh, face and challenge and it's, uh, it's a judgment call and better be cautious and uh, when you're questioning uh, instability uh, then you'd rather keep the hardware in. If you have a multi uh, uh, organism uh, infection then you might consider removing uh, uh, the hardware and keep or keep what's necessary only for stability and preventing neurologic compromise. If you had a significant infection with soft tissue loss, uh, then you have to resort to either back or flaps or both. An older study from the European Spine Journal from 2007 uh, 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 regarding surgical treatment of pyogenic vertebral osteomyelitis with spinal instrumentation. And again, uh, most of the anterior only, uh, only were cervical cases with other comorbidities and hence higher rate of mortality rate were, were discovered. Uh, increased in invasiveness with two-stage procedure did not increase the mortality. And uh, the presence of instrumentation did not prevent the body from fighting infection. And again, this goes to those who pre uh, preserve the hardware. And furthermore, uh, the more complicated procedure requiring more reconstruction can explain the higher recurrence. What about hyperbaric oxygen? Uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy enabled infection cure in five out of six patients in this particular study with, uh, with spinal osteomyelitis complicated by medical comorbidities or the failure of primary therapy. Um, not many centers afford to have this and not many patients uh, have this. Uh, uh, will get this. Usually it's uh, reserved for patients who, who fail medical therapy and medical and surgical therapy. Okay, this is another clinical study uh, uh, from uh, British Columbia, from University of British Columbia, read by Dr. Charlie uh, Fisher and John Street. Uh, they tried to put a score on uh, post-operative infection treatment score. This was uh, created and validated and they looked at uh, categorizing patients who present with infection post-op and uh, whether to see uh, single debridement or multiple de debridements were required. And as expected, the lumbar sacral uh, incisions as well as multi-organism demanded more than one debridement. How to prevent prophylactic antibiotic, the usage of Ioban, whether you do shaving or clipping, what's ideal, optimization of the medical condition of the patient and the nutritional status. So according to uh, North American Spine Society, uh, there are no superior agents. I know we always, uh, or at least I'll speak for myself, we're always used to having uh, one or two grams of cefazolin uh, during my training, but at the time being in most hospitals, uh, other agents are being used such as third generation cephalosporin or vancomycin and gentamicin, particularly in cases of uh, uh, allergies. 
There are no evidence to support repeat antibiotics intraoperatively. However, uh, common sense might still dictate for patients having longer lengthy procedures, more complex to have additional doses and routinely are given at uh, six hours mark. Uh, prevention intra-op, uh, try to limit your blood loss. Uh, irrigation, some uh, uh, believe in the usage of uh, povidone iodine. Uh, double gloving, vancomycin powder is one of the things that a lot of surgeons have started using in the past few years. Um, the usage of uh, OR rooms with, uh, equipped with laminar flow, uh, proper watertight closure, and ensuring with anesthesia that the patient is going through normal therapy. Uh, this uh, study uh, looked into the usage of vancomycin uh, powder and uh, basically uh, the risk of surgical site infection is uh, 1.6 times more likely in the control group and that vancomycin powder may have prevented one in every 67 patients and that patients with vancomycin powder application had nearly twice the risk of developing other uncommon uh, organism or polymicrobial gram-negative organisms. So this, obviously, this study was not supporting the usage of uh, uh, vancomycin powder. Uh, and they were advising uh, not, not to use it except the patient have advanced age, diabetes, smoker, uh, complex pathology, almost sounds like most of my patients. Uh, while another clinical study uh, had shown that uh, they showed their series uh, from early 2012 until 2014 where they're uh, not doing anything uh, unusual. And then they started for a couple of years using uh, povidone iodine. And then in the past, uh, and then 2016, 2017, they started uh, using vancomycin powder. And they realized uh, that uh, uh, significant reduction in both deep and superficial surgical site infection, and that povidone iodine was helpful in preventing or reducing uh, superficial uh, surgical site infection. Uh, Post-op, what do you do? Antibiotics, again, no support for more than 24 hours. Uh, closed drain and glycemic control were among the most important factors. Uh, no uh, glycemic control, what, uh, there was an emphasis on glycemic control by many studies. Uh, the use of drain is still a debate. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Fahad Abdeljabbar, Dr. Firas Weli, and, uh, uh, and their group uh, back in Montreal during their training uh, came up with this study, uh, not supporting the use of, uh, vancomycin, uh, of uh, drains routinely. And uh, I would beg uh, to differ, as I've uh, been bitten a few times in the past, and I've uh, recently uh, been doing a lot of drains for, all, for most of my patients. Maybe because they're multiple comorbidity, I'd like to also keep my wound dry. Uh, okay, back to this case to finalize. Uh, this is 73 year old male, uh, type two diabetic, hypertensive, had a prior decompression surgery about six years ago. It was not very helpful. It was for the four five. He had spondy. And I did a, as you see, uh, L2 to L5 uh, decompression fixation, uh, and then L4-5 uh, uh, T-lift. Was doing extremely well in the first week. Second week, uh, upon discharge, he was starting to have some problems and some pain. And uh, it was weird because his wound was healing well. There was no signs of fever. And he was uh, able to... Uh, stand up and walk during the hospital stay, but after discharge, it was extremely difficult to mobilize. And he was comfortable at rest, at uh, rest, uh, but he was having difficulty standing up or bending forward. Um, so I did labs, CBC was normal, and we know that in best of cases, 25% only positive. ESR was negative, and he was only three weeks uh, out of surgery, and usually it takes three, uh, four to six weeks, but ESR was, neg was normal. CRP was normal. It was beyond the uh, elevated levels. And I also uh, did um, an MRI, which I will show now, and it showed the compressive hematoma at the L2-3 and an L4-5, which I aspirated uh, with, a, with the C-arm guidance, and it was negative after it was sent for culture. However, 
I also worked them up uh, with imaging and I did a, a CT scan and I realized that uh, the cage that I placed was displaced slightly posterior on the scout image. Um, the rest of the uh, uh, image of the CT scan did not add any additional information as you can see that the cage was still uh, partly at the, at the edge with the, uh, with the vertebral body. The rest of the screws were all okay and uh, not compressing any nerve. So uh, I was wondering why we're still having significant pain and reduction to limit and limitation to range of motion. MRI, you can see to the left the T2 and to the right uh, T1 with uh, contrast. Um, initially, this was reported as uh, possible discitis. I reviewed it with an MSK radiologist. He said, Chaddy, there is no enhancement to the contrast. And you can see the compression effect here and the compression effect here. And with the CT scan and the amount of pain that he was having, I decided to go ahead and open them up. Uh, and this is the compression here, the compression there. No clear uh, ring enhancement and the, and the cage seemed to be reasonable here, only to open him up and realize that the cage was almost in level with the tulips here. So what happened in this case, uh, I was still questioning infection, although the soft tissue seemed to be normal and clean. Uh, I sent samples and they were all came, came back negative. I sent samples from the hematoma right there and right there and the bone, from the bone uh, graft that I placed and in third disc space all came back negative. Turned out that the patient had broken both L5 pedicles and had mechanical instability and now he's okay. I had to revise him and go down to S1. Conclusion, uh, I, I only presented this case, not as a case of infection, but infection came to my mind as the first uh, thing being the most common. And uh, sometimes imaging can be deceiving. Uh, conclusion, post-operative infection are devastating for patients and mostly for surgeons. Uh, preoperative medical optimization is required. Routine uh, preoperative antibiotic dosing uh, should be known and should be of enough uh, and, re and uh, appropriate for each single patient. Sterile surgical equi equipment uh, should be used should have high index of suspicion in any patient with increasing axial pain. MRI, blood works, biopsy are essential for management. Proper antibiotic can treat most infection. Please involve your ID team uh, and follow culture's routine. Uh, seems like a simple request, but many times it's been ignored. Surgery is indicated if neurological deterioration, spinal instability, abscess formation, severe pain, or systematic uh, signs of infection. Multidisciplinary team, including infectious disease specialists, spinal surgeons, and plastic surgeons are necessary to approach severe post-operative infection. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shadi, for the great talk. Uh, so let's go to the questions. Uh, we, there are very few questions. Um, So if you have an infection, like a post-op infection, you did the IND, you put the patient on antibiotic, for how long do you think you need to follow up those patients to make sure they are uh, free of infection? Um, I rely mostly on uh, clinical follow-up. I have a routine of following my patients that uh, one week, two weeks, six weeks, three months, six months, and one year. Uh, it sounds a lot. So I might even see them more often for patients who had been uh, just treated with uh, infection, uh, mainly and check if the wound is okay, if the patients are doing clinically fine. If uh, they're having extended periods of uh, pain-free, then I'm comfortable that they're not having like ongoing infection. But, and I would make sure that my evaluation is like uh, uh, sound and uh, while the patient is off uh, antibiotics. So I don't wanna be masking uh, like uh, uh, infection while it exists. Okay. Um, what do you think, Dr. Mohammed Sheikh Omar, from an ID uh, team perspective? For how long do you follow up patients uh, who presented to you as a referral of a post operative spinal infection? So, yeah, the, that's an important question. So, usually with the ongoing antibiotic, 
you want to see an improvement in the lab and the clinical finding, as Dr. Shadi was mentioning. But what is more important is following up the patient after finishing the antibiotic, because really we, we really guide our, guide our duration with the clinical improvement at what the clinical guideline says. But sometimes we may need to even extend the antibiotic beyond six weeks, beyond one month, beyond three months. It's all clinical judgment because in antibiotic therapy in ID we don't we're not like uh, we're not like cardiologists. We have fixed time for using um, uh, the the medication. So usually we go with clinical. Sometimes I extend it up to like two weeks more, one month more. Nothing wrong. You just need to have clinical improvement. And the most clinical the the most cl critical period is after you stop the antibiotic. You want also to follow the ESR and CRP, making sure it's settling down. Okay. Um, so this is another question for Dr. Shadi. So in case of uh, a bad uh, virulent infection, uh, are you going to go for primary closure or you can consider uh, doing a VAC for those patients? Um, again, for patients who have uh, uh, a single organism, uh, patients that I think that have uh, cleaned really well during the debridement, I would go with the primary closure, uh, ensuring that the patient is stable mechanically and that I have enough uh, healthy soft tissue to obtain like watertight closure. If I'm not happy with the soft tissue, particularly with the muscles available to cover the surgical site or the quality of the uh, subcutaneous fat, I would consider uh, having uh, back dressing. Uh, ensuring that at least I approximate the muscles over the, uh, the neur neural element so that I'm not affecting uh, uh, the patient neurologic status or giving him any uh, neurocompromise with the suction power of the back. Okay. And I always uh, consult with the plastic surgeons. Um, and then I had one case of uh, dehiscence. It was not uh, like they usually say, if you have a dehiscence, then you have an infection. Uh, but uh, in that case, uh, I was uh, lucky to have a, a plastic surgeon uh, available, and he developed like he did a like a, a flap and uh, closed my incision. Okay, so Dr. Mohammed Sheikh Omar, I have a question. Uh, it's not my question; it's from the attendees. So, can you give us um, uh, a guideline or protocol if you want us to refer your cases? Hopefully we don't get the infections, but in case we have post-operative spinal infections, what's your protocol? Uh, your protocol in terms of blood tests. So how frequent you do the CBC, ESR, CRP? Is it weekly? Is it? Um, uh, let me know about your thoughts. Yeah, in general we do labs weekly for those cases. So any patient who are on an antibiotic. We are not monitoring only the, the clinical improvement, but we also monitor side effects. So anyhow, we, we will need a weekly lab that's based on the practice, what we used to do in um, the US and what we are doing here in Saudi. So we do a weekly lab or minimum every two weeks if the resources is limited or if the patient lives far away, he cannot come to your clinic in a weekly basis, we can extend it to two weeks. But basically, we monitor the inflammatory markers and the liver function and the CBC for a possible potential side effect. Okay. So a question for uh, Dr. Khalid Madani, as well as Dr. Mohammed. What's your experience uh, with MDR uh, TB cases, the multi-drug resistant cases? Uh, did you face any, Dr. Khalid Madani? And what's your recommendation, Dr. Mohammed, when you face such difficult cases. Uh, Dr. Khalid, we need you need to turn on your mic. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the MDR cases, I usually rely on an ID team, so they are involved in these cases to give the proper antibiotics case. But in terms of uh, the, the, the lesion or the, the skin type, I see, I mean, if there's much uh, oozing or uh, pus coming, 
then I rely on gentlemen of uh, early debridement and wash out and clean the area. What do you think, Dr. Mohammed? So just to add on, so multidrug resistant TB, it really depends on the antibiotic resistant which you have. So if you have a risk of developing multidrug resistant TB, let's say a, a patient who had a TB in the past treated or partially treated, then you need to empirically give uh, an, uh, a second line regimen. And once you have the culture back, which usually in about three to four weeks, the culture come back, and or if the PCR suggests a resistant to rifampin, then you can um, uh, apply the second line regimen. Now, multidrug resistant, we have, we have also an, an extended or uh, pan drug resistant or extended drug resistant. In those cases, usually they require IV treatment and, the, and very prolonged therapy. So it's not only nine months, we may extend it to two years sometimes. Um, so yeah, uh, multidrug resistant TB is very challenging topic. Okay, um, so there are a few questions for, for the previous talk. So there was a, uh, actually there is a comment by one of the attendees mentioning that he attended a recent AO webinar, which I attended personally, and they uh, showed a case uh, for a patient who needed an urgent orthopedic intervention, uh, a lady with multiple open fractures in Korea. And actually they had to wait six hours for the COVID-19 results. Unfortunately, they ended up doing an amputation for that patient. What's your comment on that, uh, Dr. Mohammed? Do you think we have to wait for such results to do uh, a semi-urgent or urgent cases, or we just go ahead? Well, I mean, it really depends on the scenario. And if there is any urgent or emergent cases, I think you should you should have just to follow the most the worst case scenario we mentioned. So, worst case scenario, it's a positive COVID, and you're gonna end up off doing operation anyway for emergent cases. So you take all your full precautions uh, because the, for some cases, the more delay happens, the worse outcome. So you just take your full precautions until, because especially in Saudi Arabia, the practice here is very different than outside. If you send the test nowadays, the Minister of Health will get it to you back in three days. So that's yeah. really like long time. Um, so, um, taking okay. precaution for emergency cases as a suspected COVID, uh, I think that's the way to go for at this point. So another question, what do you think about the ventilators uh, which were used for patients who are COVID-19 positive? Any special procedures to decontaminate those? Uh, what are the recommendations? What do you think? Well, this is all like, it depends on the, the, the hospital guidelines. So each hospital guidelines, they have the, um, the recommendation on decontaminating these ventilators, and it depends on the machine itself. So you do the decontaminating uh, protocol based on the machine and the hospital available guidelines. So each hospital will have their own uh, guidelines. All right, uh, so I think uh, we're gonna conclude our session for the night. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers for their great effort uh, for staying to such a late time, as well as all the attendees, like we're supposed to finish this session a while ago, but I think uh, the questions uh, dragged on and we really enjoyed all the discussions. It's great to bring uh, all teams together. Uh, it's not about surgeons. Uh, we are a multidisciplinary uh, a society. It's always great to have other people from different disciplines. Uh, because we work in teams to prevent uh, to provide the best care for patients. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Naif, Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Shadi, as well as Dr. Khalid Madani. And thanks a lot uh, for Bilal, uh, who was organizing and hosting this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, take care, stay safe, all of you, and uh, see you in our next webinar, inshallah, uh, which is going to be uh, uh, held by our uh, colleagues in uh, Riyadh. Uh, probably the uh, invitation was sent to all of you. So hopefully we see you, uh, inshallah, uh, in the next webinar. Take care. Yeah, take care. Thank you. Thank you.